please join me for the year in the life of the timber rattlesnake, where we will watch this fascinating reptile eke out an existence through the changing seasons. This will include taking a close look at some of the snake's more interesting behavior, such as denning, communal birthing, and combat dances. Welcome to New York in the middle of winter when the conditions are inhospitable for the local timber rattlesnake. Yet this is a good time to begin our year with this iconic reptile because the timber rattlesnake must first survive the winter before the rest of their life history story can be told. That begs the question, how does this cold-blooded animal ride out this unforgiving season? Well, they do so by seeking refuge in structures like this which allows them access beyond winter's lethal temperatures. These rocky enclaves are the snake's communal dens, also referred to as hibernacula. Now, broadly speaking, there are three types of timber rattlesnake dens in the Northeast. Talus dens are basically just rocky slides. Fallen rock dens consist of large chunks of granite, partially covered by soil. Ledge dens are, well, just that. The entrance to the hibernaculum occurring at the base of a ledge or crevices in the rock face itself. Whatever the type of den, they share two things in common. All face in a southerly direction to maximize solar exposure for fall and spring basking. And as previously mentioned, they must allow the snakes access below the freeze line. Although not the focus of this video, it should be noted that there is actually a fourth type of timber rattlesnake den in the northeast. And these occur, interestingly, along streams in white cedar swamps located in the pine barrens of southern New Jersey. Elevation of rattlesnake dens vary and are most influenced by latitude. In the southern Appalachians, for an example, dens can be as high as 4,700 feet. Further north in New York and New England, most hibernacular are under 2,000 feet. While in the low-lying pine barrens, dens average only around 100 feet in elevation. Den populations vary as well, ranging from under a dozen animals to over 100. In New York, most dens average between 30 and 100 animals. Worldwide, there are numerous snake species that engage in communal denning. Here in North America, this includes other species of rattlesnakes, also copperheads, occasionally cottonmouths, and several colubrids. There is one species of snake that has taken communal denning to astronomical numbers, and that is the red-sided garter snake, specifically the populations that reside in the interlake region of Manitoba, Canada. The most well-known from this region are the Narciss snake dens, which have become a popular tourist destination, and in my opinion, is one of the greatest natural wonders of the world. The Narciss snake dens are situated in limestone sinkholes, Collectively, the four dens are refuge for upwards of a mind-boggling 70,000 snakes. The dens are accessible and open to the public, and I highly recommend a visit. You can find out more information by checking out my Narciss Snake Den video, the link to which is in the description below. After spending six months sheltered in their dens, timber rattlesnakes begin crawling to the surface and out into the mild, inviting spring sunshine. Initial emergence begins in mid-April and involves just a few snakes. Peak emergence occurs the first 10 days of May or so, with the last stragglers on the surface by the end of the month. Now, depending on the conditions, most rattlesnakes will remain at a den site for several days after emergence, while some bold individuals will begin moving away from their hibernaculum upon initial egress. Overall, by mid-May, the majority of timber rattlesnakes are on their migration route to choice basking areas, which are usually, but not always, higher up the mountain or ridge top from the overwintering den. The migration route is often made up of partially buried rocks that can even resemble a fallen rock den, and in some cases do contain overwintering den pockets. 
Such satellite dens should be considered as part of the overall hibernaculum, however. In many cases, what might be confused as a den pocket is really a staging area along the rattlesnake's migration route. These staging areas offer short-term protection when unseasonably cool weather descends on the area during spring egress or autumn ingress. Admittedly, it can be tough to determine the difference between a staging area and a bona fide den pocket, but after observing several ingress and egress cycles, one can make an educated guess to help differentiate between the two. The basking areas the migrating rattlesnakes are seeking can vary in distance and number from hibernacula in an area, but they all provide the microclimate necessary for proper thermal regulation, ranging from plenty of warm open sunny spots to the cooler enclaves under granite slabs, or shadows cast by adjacent vegetation such as grasses, blueberry bushes, and bear oak. Spring basking is necessary to help raise the snake's core body temperature for vital metabolic needs such as digestion, preparation for the season's first shed, and boosting the immune system to fight off any current or future ailment, most notably snake fungal disease, which we will discuss later during fall ingress. In early June, timber rattlesnakes that have not fed or those seeking additional meals leave the basking areas to forage in the surrounding forest. Prey consists mainly of rodents, namely mice, squirrels, and chipmunks, but birds are occasionally taken. Timber rattlesnakes are ambush hunters, often positioning themselves along rodent runways such as fallen trees, with their heads perpendicular to such log runways. The snakes locate active rodent runways using their incredible sense of smell, which compensates for their poor eyesight and limited hearing. Although rattlesnakes have nostrils, they primarily use their tongues to pick up the scent of nearby prey or potential predators. When a snake flicks its tongue, it gathers odors that are present in microscopic particles wafting through the air. And then when the tongue is retracted, the tines slide into a highly advanced vomeral nasal organ called the Jacobson's organ, where the chemical information is gathered and quickly interpreted as a particular smell. Rattlesnakes have evolved an additional adaptation for finding prey, and that is their heat-sensing facial pits, referred to as laurel pits. These organs are located between the eyes and the nostrils and is why rattlesnakes along with copperheads and cottonmouths are aptly called pit vipers. These sensory organs detect thermal infrared rays as those given off by warm-blooded prey such as rodents and birds or potential mammalian predators and can also assist with thermal regulation. At short range, laurel pits can detect a temperature difference as small as a half a degree Fahrenheit and can even detect a candle flame from just over 30 feet away. This incredible adaptation allows pit vipers to hunt in complete darkness. Tongue scenting and infrared detection allows rattlesnakes to situate themselves near prey activity. And when such prey scurries by, tantalizingly close, a rattlesnake will strike out faster than the blink of a human eye, with its mouth wide open, its tubular hollow fangs ready to deliver their lethal venom. Rattlesnakes primarily use their venom to subdue prey and is only deployed for defense as a last resort. These reptiles' main defense actually is camouflage and many will remain motionless even when potential predators or clueless humans walk within inches of them. Now if the snake feels like it's been spotted by a likely threat or is about to inadvertently get stepped on by a large animal such as a deer or human, they will give off their namesake warning. The unnerving sound of a rattlesnake's rattle, especially when unexpected, as in the case with this bobcat kit, usually does the trick and scares off the intruder. A rattlesnake's rattle is made up of the protein keratin, the same protective protein that makes up our hair and nails. Now a new segment is added to the rattle string every time a rattlesnake sheds. Since shed rates vary and rattles break off partly or completely from time to time, it is unreliable trying to gauge a rattlesnake's age by counting the segments. Despite timber rattlesnakes' unique and powerful means of defending themselves, they can fall victim to such predators as bobcats, coyotes, opossums, raptors, and as with all species of rattlesnakes, humans. More on that later. By midsummer, the majority of rattlesnake cohorts are in the forest foraging, periodically returning to basking areas to shed which also becomes a good rendezvous spot for males and receptive females to meet up and breed. And since some of these basking areas are visited by males from different dens, this ensures genetic diversity. 
Males will occasionally compete with one another over receptive females by engaging in what is called a combat dance. These combat dances are really just wrestling matches where one male tries to express dominance by repeatedly pinning its opponent to the ground. Timber rattlesnakes can breed throughout the active season, with females storing the male sperm into the following spring before the eggs are fertilized. Once these eggs are fertilized, these now pregnant females, also referred to as gravid, position themselves at birthing rookeries during the summer months. These rookeries or gestating sites are often the same basking areas used by the population during spring egress or fall ingress. Now a birthing rookery has to have a microhabitat for suitable thermoregulation. Rattlesnakes are cold-blooded and gravid females must seek out warm temperatures for proper gestation. An exposed rocky outcrop made up of large chunks of granite surrounded by low shade producing vegetation is ideal. This arrangement offers a wide range of temperatures for the females to shift around in as they strive to keep their core body temperature in the 80s. During the height of summer, the surface of rocks can reach 120 degrees, so the slabs of granite must be configured in such a way that allows the snakes to go deep enough to escape such lethal temperatures. Such a shelter offers a secondary benefit as it affords protection against potential predators. Birthing rookeries are often communal and are usually made up of closely related females that in all likelihood were born at or near the birthing rookeries they now occupy. In other words, such sites are generational, just like the dens themselves. Timber rattlesnakes give live birth in late summer, usually in September. Understandably, this is a vital life history period for this reptile, and for me personally has included some of my most cherished natural encounters. In the Northeast, timber rattlesnake litter sizes range between 6 and 18. The newborns, or neonates, are about a foot in length and chunky in appearance. If you noticed, all of the neonates are this uniform dull gray. They remain this way for about 10 days after birth until they are ready to go through their first shed. During this time, the mothers remain at the rookeries. The main purpose for this is for the young to establish and familiarize themselves with their mother's or other adult's scent. After the baby shed, they are ready to move out and will attempt to follow their mother's scent along with other adults back to the overwintering den. Mothers do not protect or overtly defend their young, or at least I have never observed such behavior. But their mere presence, such as their size and rattling defense, might keep potential predators from approaching birthing rookeries in the first place. Freshly shed babies look like miniature versions of the adults and exhibit the wide range of colors and patterns timber rattlesnakes are appreciated for. Neonates are born with a pre-button, the precursor to their rattle. After their first shed, they add a button or segment to the rattle. It should be noted that adult female timber rattlesnakes can only breed every two to four years. And this is because postpartum females are so metabolically drained after giving birth that it takes a while just to get their weight back up into the normal range. Considering that females don't reach sexual maturity until they are between four and eight years old, they may only reproduce three or four times during their lives. Since birthing takes place on the cusp of autumn, Postpartum females don't have much time to secure meals before they must migrate to the population's overwintering den. And their young are also on a race against time, having to navigate a big world for the first time, often in just a matter of days before autumn has a chance to halt their progress with lethal temperatures. Near the end of September, the active season for the timber rattlesnake in the Northeast begins to quickly wind down, as all cohorts begin to converge at their population's overwintering den. Here we have a big four foot plus yellow morph timber rattlesnake, less than 10 feet from the den entrance. It is in a sense spring migration in reverse, with the first arrivals representing only a small percentage of the population but within the first 10 days of October, the majority of timber rattlesnakes are at or near their hibernacula. Ingress migration is usually complete by the second or third week in October. Overall, fall migration is a shorter time period compared to springs. And as previously mentioned, baby rattlesnakes often only have a matter of days to complete the journey to the ancestral hibernaculum before it gets too cold for them to move or survive. And here, just a couple feet in front of me, we have found a baby timber rattlesnake that has successfully traveled thousands of feet from way up on the ridge and has followed the scent of another adult 
and has made it to the ancestral wintering den. The rate of survival for babies that have successfully migrated to the population's overwintering den substantially increases and for the rest of their lives they will migrate back and forth to the ancestral hibernaculum just as generations and generations have done before for decades or even centuries. As mentioned near the beginning of this video, other species of snakes engage in communal denning and interestingly several local species will actually den near or right alongside timber rattlesnakes creating in effect a multi-species snake den. These primarily include the eastern copperhead, eastern black rat snake, northern black racer, eastern garter snake and eastern milk snake. A close cousin of the timber rattlesnake, the mountainous race of the eastern copperhead, also a venomous pit viper, shares many similar life history traits with its larger cousin. So in addition to choosing overlapping hibernacula, copperheads are also ambush hunters that prefer rodents and will even share the same birthing rookeries with rattlesnakes. Copperheads main defense, which they are masters of, is their uncanny ability at camouflage, especially while quietly resting in leaf litter on the forest floor. If they feel as though they have been spotted, copperheads will retreat down the nearest hole, often rattling their tail as a warning not to pursue. It should be noted that many species of snakes worldwide, both venomous and non-venomous, rattle their tails, often against dry vegetation, as a defense warning. But they are not trying to mimic rattlesnakes, since rattles evolved much later than tail shaking. As with timber rattlesnakes, copperheads will only strike out when they feel as though they are in immediate physical danger. The eastern black rat snake, which can attain a length of six feet or more, is not only the largest snake that can be found denning with timber rattlesnakes in the northeast, but one of the largest in the country. Now all snakes in the northeast exhibit varying degrees of arboreal behavior, but for the black rat snake it can be a way of life often spending days at a time during the summer up in trees hiding from predators while hunting prey such as squirrels, birds and their eggs. These large snakes subdue and kill their prey through constriction before, like all snakes, swallowing them whole. Black rat snakes are egg layers depositing their clutches in a humid subsurface nest chamber. One of the more common snakes found denning with timber rattlesnakes the northern black racer may resemble the black rat snake to the casual observer, but they are not closely related. Although racers are egg layers like rat snakes, they do not constrict prey, but overpower them through brute force. Black racers have a diverse diet consisting of rodents, birds, amphibians and reptiles, including other snakes, and will raid copperhead and rattlesnake birthing rookeries to actively prey on their young. The eastern garter snake, a childhood favorite of generations of reptile enthusiasts, is a small attractive snake that also exhibits a diverse diet but mostly prefers amphibians. As with the much larger pit vipers, garter snakes give live birth and in addition to denning with copperheads and rattlesnakes, they will sometimes share the same birthing rookeries. The eastern milk snake, a medium sized, handsome but secretive snake, is only occasionally observed denning with timber rattlesnakes. Although, due to their cryptic nature, it is difficult to determine just how many overwinter with rattlesnakes. Milk snakes are egg layers and feed on small rodents, bird nestlings and reptiles. After October 31, most denning timber rattlesnakes will not resurface until the following April or May, but some limited basking does occur in November. In fact, compared to the end of October, there might be a slight uptick in basking during November because the deciduous canopy has lost most of its foliage allowing more sunlight to reach the forest floor. Late season basking or even winter basking may occur for several reasons. Warmer temperatures for example are required for a snake to digest food. A late season undigested meal could literally rot in the stomach of a chilled brumating snake. This could be dire if not fatal for the animal. Another reason a rattlesnake may bask on a mild autumn or winter day, mild being relative, is for the snake's health. A snake with an elevated body temperature results in a heightened immune system and has a better chance of combating disease or infection. Moreover, direct exposure to the sun's ultraviolet rays can play an important role in curing any number of maladies, especially snake fungal disease. Although this disease is caused by a common naturally occurring fungus, 
Snake fungal disease is considered an emerging infectious disease, affecting at least a dozen other snake species, particularly rattlesnakes. And in the Northeast, that includes not only the timber rattlesnake, but the eastern Massasauga. Symptoms of snake fungal disease include crusting of the skin, ulcerated skin, nodules under the skin, and milky eyes. In severe cases, facial disfiguration and death can occur. The greatest threat to the well-being of the timber rattlesnake is and has been humans. For centuries, this misunderstood animal was killed on site, which eventually manifested itself to government-sanctioned roundups and bounties. Even a liberal, forward-thinking state like Vermont had a bounty on timber rattlesnakes until the 1970s. In parts of the West, namely Texas and Oklahoma, Western Diamondback rattlesnake roundups occur with reckless abandon. The largest of these, the Sweetwater Texas Rattlesnake Roundup, slaughters thousands of snakes at their annual event under the guise of population control and hunting rights. However, many of these snakes are collected in remote areas, far from human habitation, and are often done so by gassing dens, forcing the snakes to retreat to the surface where they are easily seized. These reptiles are captured days or weeks before the roundup and are often kept in overcrowded, inhumane conditions. At the very least, this is unethical hunting and abuse of a natural resource and should be viewed with disdain by the general hunting community, many of which respect the natural world and the particular resource they are harvesting, which includes limiting an animal's suffering and always striving for a quick or clean kill. Sweetwater dishes out a lot of disinformation at their event, especially regarding the life history of rattlesnakes, such as that they can travel 25 miles a day and ultimately end up 100 miles from their dens. This blatant falsehood helps justify killing rattlesnakes in remote areas, where in all likelihood these snakes will never cross paths with a single human during their lifetime. Another falsehood, the venom collected, referred to as milking, is not used to make anti-venom. And the medical advice they offer if someone is envenomated by a rattlesnake is outdated and will likely cause more harm than good. So despite what you see in old spaghetti westerns, you cannot suck out the venom after being bit, no more than you can suck out a COVID or flu vaccination after receiving the shots. Oh, and by the way, rattlesnakes do not change color like chameleons or octopuses. The one that I'm choking about. <laughs> Sweetwater's unethical hunting practices and disinformation campaign speak to a broader ignorance and fear many folks harbor towards rattlesnakes and snakes in general. But attitudes have started to shift, albeit slowly. So despite the fact that the majority of people still fear snakes, most of them in recent years have begun to accept that they are a necessary part of the ecosystem and their absence would even cause more harm than good for our own species. Even one of the Sweetwater organizers admitted to a large gathering that this country would be overrun with rabbits and rodents without the presence of rattlesnakes. Now, I am aware that the majority of you watching this are like me and have a keen interest in reptiles. I do hope a few of you that, for a lack of a better word, hate rattlesnakes, still gave this documentary a chance and walk away with at least some measure of appreciation for a misunderstood animal trying to eke out an existence in a challenging world. So we have made it to mid-November, which means our timber rattlesnakes have been sheltered in their dens for at least a couple weeks now, and will not be coaxed back out until warmer weather arrives next spring. So basically, that will conclude our year with the timber rattlesnake. Thank you for tagging along, and if you like this production, well, please consider liking and or subscribing. Thank you.